Greetings. This is the one you've known as Jesus the Christ. I'd like to speak about the difference between spiritual self-inquiry and self-analysis. Both are important tools in the seeker's toolbox, but very different ones and serve different purposes, and it's best to understand this. The biggest difference between spiritual self-inquiry and self-analysis is the self that's being inquired into or analyzed. In spiritual self-inquiry, the self that's being inquired into is the true self, the self with a capital S, meaning the divine within you, which isn't really a self, as it isn't an entity or a thing. In self-analysis, the self that's being analyzed is the false self, which also isn't an entity or a thing, because it's imaginary. Although the true self is not a thing, it's also not imaginary like the false self. The false self is called false because it's imaginary. It doesn't exist. The true self, on the other hand, while it isn't a thing that can be sensed with the five senses, it isn't imaginary, but what makes it possible for you to experience life. Without the true self, you wouldn't be alive or experience what you do. The true self is the life force and consciousness that animates the body-mind, and not just your body-mind, but every life form. Consciousness and life force are much better words to describe the true self because it's not something that has boundaries like an object or a body. The consciousness or life force that animates your body is not contained within your body alone, but enlivens all of life. When it withdraws from a life form at death, it appears that the form was alive, but it was never the form that was alive, but the life force within that form that gave it life. Energy is another good word for the true self, for it is in fact energy and has no set form or appearance. The true self can't be seen or experienced by your five senses, and yet it's what's behind all life. In self-inquiry, you're stopping a moment to investigate this thing called life. What is it and who are you? These are the deepest questions that can be asked, and there's no simple answer, no answer that the mind can come up with, because the mind wasn't designed to answer such questions. The mind can only know what the senses can sense, and even then the mind can't know reality. It only attaches labels to reality so as to be able to communicate with others. The mind is not equipped to know or even explore the true self. All it can do is attach a few words to it, such as consciousness, awareness, energy, or life force. But having words for something doesn't qualify as knowing it. As a result, self-inquiry leaves the mind blank, at a dead end. Knowing the true self is very different than describing a tree or some other thing, or distinguishing one thing from another, which is what the mind was designed for. Energy is energy, and it isn't distinct. It animates form, and that form is distinct, but energy itself is not distinct. This is all to say that self-inquiry will get you nowhere. It will lead to wordlessness, emptiness, silence, stillness, the absence of thought whereas self-analysis is all about using words to describe something, even though what's being described is imaginary. That's funny, isn't it? Self-analysis is analysis of the false self, describing it, 
which doesn't exist except in one's own mind. And yet, as long as you believe the false self exists, it's useful to note its attributes, what you believe about it. So that's self-analysis. It's becoming clear about what you believe about yourself, however false those beliefs might be. This is useful because if you believe something false about yourself, it's best to know what you believe, since it isn't helpful to believe something that isn't true, especially about yourself. If those beliefs were primarily positive, then believing them wouldn't be such a problem. But most people hold lots of negative beliefs about themselves, and these beliefs limit them, make them unhappy, and cause problems in their relationships. Believing lies hurts. Believing you're the false self hurts. Self-analysis is very important in becoming free of those lies. First, you have to become aware of what you believe about yourself, and then you have to see that those beliefs are false. That's the hard part, because you're wired, programmed, to believe your own thoughts. If that weren't the case, it would be impossible to have a false self. You'd question it out of existence pretty quickly. But because you automatically believe that you are the self-images and beliefs that make up the false self, it's not so easy to see that they're false or that there is, in fact, no such thing as what you think of yourself as. The stories you tell about yourself simply aren't true, but because you believe them, they seem true to you. Or others tell you who you are and you believe them, and that becomes part of your self-image. In any event, regardless of where these beliefs come from, they're false, and the reason they're false is that they're partial truths, stories about oneself that relate to one's behavior at a particular moment in time that aren't true for long, if ever true. In other words, you behave a certain way in response to some event, and then you or someone else turns that into a personal story about how you are, as if you're always that way, when of course you don't always behave or respond the same way, unless and until you formed a self-image around that behavior, and then you may behave a certain way because you believe you are that way. Stories are the ego's spin on life. Stories give events and experience meaning that isn't inherently there. They confer false meaning on an event or experience. They draw a conclusion. For example, you fall and then you tell the story, I'm so clumsy. These false conclusions that the ego comes to as a result of life's events are what eventually need healing, and that healing happens by seeing that these conclusions are false. They're stories the mind makes up about one's experience. They're fabricated by the mind. These stories, which always have you at the center of them, are how the false self is created and maintained. These stories are about a you that doesn't exist, but seems to. In any moment, there are many possible ways you might respond, not just one way. Granted, you might get into the habit of responding a certain way and become predictable, and everyone has certain tendencies to behave in set ways according to their astrology but that doesn't mean anything about you personally. It's just how you chose to behave in that moment or how someone perceived your behavior in that moment and labeled you. I'm bad, I'm dumb, I'm impatient, I'm irresponsible, and so on, are stories told about a you 
based on some behavior at some point in time. But this you doesn't actually exist. All the you ever is, is a story about you. That's the false self. It's made up of stories. But, as I said, it's helpful to see the stories you tell about yourself and believe, because if you tell them often enough, they become true, since the subconscious mind tends to produce more thoughts and feelings that support such self-images and that drive behavior in that same direction. For example, if you believe you're clumsy, your subconscious is likely to cause you to stumble more. Or if you feel incompetent, you'll lack the confidence to act competently. Your subconscious will cause you to fail. In addition, Subconsciously, you project your self-images to others who reinforce these self-images. Without realizing it, you tell people who you are, who you believe you are, and then they begin to see you this way too. And when others perceive you the way you perceive yourself, that reinforces your own ideas about yourself. A self-sustaining feedback loop is created and your self-images are maintained. This is not easy to see about yourselves. As I said, much of this is going on on subconscious levels. The subconscious is the storehouse of thoughts and feelings, and when certain thoughts and feelings have been thought and felt repeatedly, they become patterns, and patterns become self-images or identities. That's all the false self is. It's made up of stories you told yourself about yourself over and over again, or a parent or others told about you. And these self-images or identities are reinforced and held in place by the feelings generated by these stories, which make the stories seem real then people start behaving in accordance with their self-images. They become what they believe themselves to be, and others experience them this way too. Self-analysis can help you see this about your self-images and identities, and thereby free you from those that are negative and limiting. I've often used the term inquiry to describe this process of self-analysis. However, spiritual self-inquiry, where you're seeking to know your true self, is quite different than this, in that you ask a few simple questions and then sit with the experience that those questions elicit. The most basic self-inquiry question is, Who am I? This will draw forth any number of answers from the mind. I'm a woman, I'm a teacher, I'm a pianist, and so forth. You keep asking this question until you have no more answers, and you sit with that experience. The point in asking this is to see that none of these answers adequately describes you. These identities and roles are more like a costume you wear. But what's wearing this costume? What's animating the costume? Who are you beyond these identities, labels, and roles? Who is this I that seems to think? And what is aware of this I? With spiritual inquiry, the point isn't to find answers, as you did in self-analysis, but to experience the absence of answers. Within that silence is the answer. You are that silence. You are what's able to observe your thoughts, ask the questions, and experience all of life. These two types of inquiry, inquiring into the false self 
and spiritual self-inquiry with a capital S go hand in hand. Both are necessary on the spiritual path. You must see through the false self and you must experience what else is here, your true self. You need both types of inquiry to see through the programming and discover your true nature. Thank you for being willing to consider these ideas. I am with you always.